Z nami danes nam zelo dragi gost, Jeremy Corbyn, pravi, da je ta pravi socialist, politik, aktivist, zadnje čase mirovnik, nekdo, s katerim pravzaprav se lahko pogovarjamo o veliko stvareh kot stranka, levica ali pa tisti, ki se zauzemamo trenutno za najbolj, bom rekla, pereče probleme, ki se mi lahko opišajo kot mirovni problemi oziroma konfliktni problemi. To bo tudi glavna nit današnjega pogovora, ki ga bo vodila Natoša Sukič, poslanka Levice. Tudi njo mislim, da ni treba posebej predstavljati. Pogovarjala pa se bosto tudi o drugih stvareh, ki se nam zdijo pomembne, da danes na tem dogodku spregovorimo z našim gostom. Tako da jaz ne bi kaj dosti več zavlačevala, bom dala kar besedo našima gostoma in moderatorke. Vam bomo pa tudi dali priložnost za vaše vprašanje, tako da prosim, lepo, izvolite. Ja, dober večer tudi z moje strani. Preden se bova z Jeremijem dotaknila, bom rekla, najnega bloka vprašanj o vojni in miru. Se bova najprej posvetila drugim temam. Hello, Jeremy. I'm very happy and honored that you are here with us today. Unfortunately, we do not have a lot of time, but I would like to ask you a few sets of questions about the war in Ukraine, about the increasing militarization in Europe and the world, about the genocide in Gaza, about the dangerous rise of the far right in Europe, about Julian Assange, about what the left has to offer for the future, about the fragmentation of the European left-wing forces, about the climate. Above all, any left meeting has to conclude with a sense of determination and hope that we can deliver a changed society for the very poorest and most dispossessed people, not only in our own countries, but all around the world. It's those principles that unite us together, and that's why I'm absolutely delighted to be here, to be able to join in your discussions over these couple of days, and thank you so much for the very generous hospitality that you've shown Lara and myself since we arrived. Thank you. So let's uh, talk first about the future, about your uh, personal plans, and about the future of uh, the Europe. And uh, uh, let me start our conversation with the crisis um, we are facing uh, at um, European and global level. In Europe, in Slovenia, probably in the UK too, with the worsening effects of climate change, the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis has erupted and as a result, energy and food prices are skyrocketing. All of this is causing worsening social hardship and um, an even deeper class um, divide. In fact, we can speak of a crisis of capitalism, of phenomena such as gentrification in urban centers, which is pushing the social vulnerable population and the working class out of the city centers and into the, the periphery. This has many negative consequences for working class families, for pensioners, for precarious youth, etc. And I would uh, be interested to hear your view on all these uh, really essential problems. So, please. <coughs> Thank you very much. I represent an inner city uh, urban working class area of North London in Parliament, and I have done for the past uh, 40 years the same constituency, so obviously I know it extremely well. It is a very diverse community. There are 70 different languages spoken. It's never been a wealthy place, but there are some wealthy people living there. Uh, but I've never known a situation where in my community alone, we have, I think, eight food banks that are open every week which provide free food for people that are desperate for it. And there's a queue outside each one of people lining up to be given boxes of pasta, 
cans of beans, toiletries, all the things that people need. And sadly, many of these people queuing up to receive this food, which is all donated, uh, there's quite a sophisticated system of donations, um, need it, and some are actually working. They're not just on Social Security benefits. So the level of poverty has become so acute that there are uh, almost a million people in Britain every year that rely on food banks for all or part of their food needs. It is a disastrous situation and it's brought about by 10 years or 12 years now of austerity, frozen wages, cuts in public um, services and a brutal social security system that removes people from benefits for the most minor misdemeanor of any sort. And so the sense of anger that's there is absolutely huge. And the strikes that have happened over the past uh, one and a half years on the railways, in the postal service, the teachers, civil servants, health workers, nurses has been huge. And I've never known a time before when doctors take strike action. I used to be a uh, union organizer for workers in the councils, local government, and within the National Health Service. And if we took action, strike action, as we did, sometimes the public would be very hostile and say, you're health workers, you should not be taking strike action. I'm at risk or my family are at risk because operations have been cancelled in the hospital. Things have changed. I was on the strike with the doctors outside our hospital a few weeks ago and people were coming up to us to say how much they support the doctors and how right they were to take action even though they personally were suffering because their operations had been cancelled. That is what 12 years of austerity has done to people. And so there are huge issues of injustice and inequality which have to be faced. And it's important that the left parties challenge the economic neoliberal agenda which ever since 2008 has resulted in cuts in public spending, restrictions on wage rises and thus falling living standards. And in Britain, most working class families are around 10 to 20 percent worse off than they were 12 years ago. And all predictions are that that fall will continue. Living standards are not rising for a number of reasons. One is wages are not rising. They haven't even made, kept up with inflation, which is now only 6% anyway. It was a bit higher for a while. Um, but it's also about an economic strategy by the government, and sadly, much of it accepted by the uh, Labour current leadership and opposition, which um, allows the very richest in our society to become richer at the expense of the poorer on the basis that you have a number of very rich people, they will invest and there will be what's called trickle-down economics and the very poorest will benefit from the wealth of the richest. It's complete and utter nonsense of the first order. We need a strategy of left parties which is about investment in public services, which is about decent pay and conditions, and not allow the employers, mm -hmm. be they in France, in Germany, in Britain, in Slovenia, or anywhere else, to reduce the already limited working condition protection that exists for so many people. And so, so it's part of it is about a crisis of confidence. Um, th there's so much to say on this, but I also think that <coughs> we have to bring together the issues also of environmental sustainability because it is working class communities all over Europe that have the shortest life expectancy, that breathe the worst air, 
that buy the cheapest, often lowest quality food and have the worst health as a result of it. On major roads in major cities all over Europe and indeed all over the world, children are breathing in foul air. And in the case of children living alongside major roads in my community, before they even start school, they've lost 15% of their lung capacity because of the foul air they've been breathing. Where there are campaigns to change it, we are getting rid of diesel vehicles and so on, and that is helping a bit. But if we accept an agenda to change our industries and livelihoods into one of environmental sustainability, where we protect biodiversity, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and don't pollute the upper atmosphere with that, then there have to be significant changes. Big business is very keen to present itself as changing these, but in reality, hitting the poorest at the same time. The environmental question is a class issue. It's an issue about how working class communities can live and sustain themselves. And so I think we have to have what I termed as the green industrial revolution, where there would be a big public investment in the conversion of industries and the energy system into something more sustainable. But at the same time, there would be protection of those jobs in those industries while the conversion goes on. Because if the left agenda on environmental sustainability is not acceptable to the communities that we're trying to represent, then there's something wrong with it. So we have to have that conversation and that sense of determination. And so that's just some of the issues that um, are being faced at the moment. Now, I know Britain is no longer a member of the EU and therefore not part of the um, European Union elections, the, the pa European Parliament elections that you're all faced with. But we are comrades across the water, if you want, and we do have to work together and develop a common economic strategy, which is about a minimum wage that's realistic, that you can live on, it is about job protection, and it is about environmental protection, and it is about investment in public services. Now, I'll finish on this point. Um, up until the time that um, the neoliberal economic agenda started to move into the ascendancy in Britain, it wasn't all perfect by any means, but my generation had free education, free health care, and free university education if they wished it and went to a university to achieve it. And also a pension that you could live on. We no longer have those things. Yes, we have a health service, but increasingly privatized and in danger of charging creeping in or rationing of health care creeping in. University students leave university with a debt of at least £70,000. That is enormous by any stretch of the imagination. And um, a housing system that is completely unsustainable. And you were talking about the uh, gentrification of inner urban areas and sending working class people way out of the city to spend a lot of money on travel. Um, and so you have people in their 30s, even 40s, who cannot get a place of their own to live and have to stay living with their parents. And in Britain, we have um, a very large number of people, probably 300,000, who are effectively homeless at the present time, either sleeping on the streets or sleeping on people's floors. Um, that is a product of this whole process of selling off and destroying public services. And so, We've got to have an agenda and an inspiration that brings people together, but above all, gives them hope. And during the um, election campaigns that I fought as leader of my party, I tried to bring that hope to people. And during our industrial actions over the past two years, an awful lot of hope has returned. It's up to us to unite across all our borders to bring that hope to all people. And don't allow the far right and the racists to blame the migrants who are not responsible for any of this. Don't allow them to blame the desperate people fleeing from wars and human rights abuse and oppression. They are not the cause of any of these problems. It is 
working class unity, is unity of left parties that can bring about that sense of hope. And so that is my short description of some of the problems that we're facing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, it sounds uh, familiar. Um, <laughs> and uh, I agree that we have to work together. But I wonder how. How can we work together to build a more progressive and fairer uh, Europe, given that uh, European left wing forces will run in the EU elections on two similar but unfortunately separate plat platforms opening the doors to an even greater power for the far rights. So, how? Well, <coughs> united, a united basis for doing things is absolutely essential. Indeed, I'm saying much the same to the left in Britain, who are not obviously facing the European elections. After I um, ceased to be the Labour leader, I... Um, helped to set up our organization, the Peace and Justice Project. And the Peace and Justice Project is a way of uniting people, whether they're in a political party or not, or active in the community, or in a particular interest cause. And what we've done is set out our five basic demands. They're quite simple, they're not complicated, but they are designed to unite people and bring them together. One, decent pay for all support the industrial actions and the strikes to start to make up the huge pay deficit that so many people have had in the case of Britain since the pay freeze has been in operation in the public sector for more than a decade. Secondly, deal with the environmental crisis and the inspiration of so many young people who want to deal with the environmental crisis by a Green New Deal which I outlined when I spoke a few minutes ago so that we bring about that more sustainable world. Thirdly, housing is a human right. It's no secret that uh, I was asked um, before the last general election, what will be the first thing you will do? And indeed, the government officials came to me to say, say we have to be prepared for the possibility of you winning the election. What's the first thing you want us to do? And I said, let's be very clear. The first thing I want to do is to say, as of now, homelessness is over. The government is going to invest enough money to ensure that every homeless person gets some kind of roof over their head as an emergency, and we, that will give us time to start a real house building program for council housing, for social secure rent. And we will control rents in the private rented sector, and we will ensure decent housing conditions for all. If we could house every homeless person during the COVID crisis, we can do it at any time. But it has to be housing as a human right. And then the fourth area was about taxation in order to ensure that we do have sufficient and efficient public services. And that would be reducing the level of taxation for those on the lowest wages. Maybe saying you don't pay any tax until you, learn, until you earn the equivalent of the minimum wage would be a good way forward. But above all, it would be increasing corporate taxation up to 26% and increasing, and in, increasing income by having a wealth tax on those with personal disposable wealth of over £10 million. All of that would make proper funding of the health and education services entirely possible. And so those were setting out the ideas on the sort of <laughs> domestic and social agenda. Then the last was on the global sphere. And we started this one by saying, as I said a moment ago, we should not blame refugees for being refugees. I've been to Calais many times, and I've talked to people in Calais who've walked or come in trucks, all the way from Afghanistan, from Kabul, or from Iraq, or from Syria, or from Libya, many places, and made it somehow or other to Calais, where they're being persecuted by fascist forces and blamed for every social problem there is in the world. These are desperate people. They're not guilty of 
anything other than being desperate people. Europe, the United States, spent billions of pounds on a war in Afghanistan. The victims are those people that are now trying to seek asylum in Europe. We've got to put our head together on this thing. If you go to war somewhere, there are consequences. And those consequences live on for decades and decades. And so it is about using the language of peace, not the language of war. Now, I do not in any way support the Russian action in trying to occupy Ukraine. I think it's wrong. I don't think they should do it. I think it's completely wrong. There has to be an end to that war. Pouring weapons into Ukraine and the Russians and Chinese pouring weapons into the Russian um, uh, attack on Ukraine will only bring about a permanent war. That permanent war will create refugees, it will kill thousands of people, and um, the only beneficiaries will be those that make the weapons. Where has the language of peace gone? Where has the language of discussing a peace process gone? Where has the UN gone in not intervening to try and engineer a ceasefire and at least some negotiations over the future. Minsk I and Minsk II were a start of that process. And so I want us to see us being not afraid to raise the question of peace for the future because it cannot go on. You just allow this war to continue. The war that's now going on, the other war that's going on that gets all the publicity is the destruction of Gaza. Now, in my life, I've been nine times to Israel, to Gaza, and to the West Bank. Every time I go, I come back more depressed than before I went. At the military occupation of the West Bank, of the growth of settlements, which now are 600,000 people in those settlements, and now the total destruction of Gaza. Obviously, the deaths of a 1,000 people on October the 7th was wrong. We all agree on that. But as Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, said, it didn't start on October the 7th. The occupation didn't begin then. It's as though the Israel Defense Force is trying to turn Gaza into year zero, destroying schools, hospitals, homes, roads, everything, and even quite deliberately destroying religious symbols and ancient archaeological remains in Gaza. It's like trying to obliterate history and then say Egypt is unreasonable in not opening the border for the people of Gaza to stream into the Sinai to create a new Gaza Strip while Israel occupies the Gaza Strip itself. 30,000 people have already died in this bombardment. Highly sophisticated weapons have been used and white phosphorus and other weaponry has been used to kill people. And uh, I meet Palestinian people that live in Britain just telling me how many of their family they've lost. Hussam Zumlot, the uh, Palestinian ambassador to Britain, has lost 100 members of his wider family to the bombardment. It is a abominable and appalling what's going on. We have to call for a ceasefire. We have to stop supplying Israel with arms which continue this bombardment. And we have to see a peace process that doesn't stop at a ceasefire, but also deals with the occupation, deals with the uh, question of the settlement policy on the West Bank where farmers have lost their land, uh, walls have been built to um, prevent uh, Palestinians even conducting farming and any other jobs they want to do. And then there's also, which doesn't get much publicity, the question of the Palestinian refugees that have been in refugee camps in, in Jordan, in Syria, in Lebanon since 1948 since before I was born, they've been in those refugee camps. And so the solidarity for peace and for the Palestinian people has got to be much bigger and stronger. So we've just got to keep on and on doing it. We've now organized, uh, I think it's nine national demonstrations in Britain already. The biggest one attracted nearly a million people and we're organizing them 
as frequently and as long as it takes. And opinion polls now say that 80% of the British public support a ceasefire. Parliament descended into chaos on Wednesday because they, there was a, an attempt to engineer a vote to prevent a, a vote on a real ceasefire. And um, uh, as a result, there's been a huge row which has actually diverted away from the real issue, which is the treatment of the Palestinian people. But I'm pleased to say we've now got another vote on Monday. I will be voting for an immediate and total ceasefire as a start of a peace process. We've got to support the poor Palestinian people and their victims. But don't forget that when the case went to the International Court of Justice, who effectively called for a ceasefire, <coughs> 300 very prominent Israeli citizens, academics, lawyers, and so on, supported the South African application to the International Court of Justice. So don't allow anyone to run away with the idea there's nobody in Israel that is opposed to what the Netanyahu government are doing. There's a great many people in Israel that do oppose it and do want to live in peace and in harmony together with Palestinian people, um, which is surely the aim we must all have. But don't walk away, don't ignore it. You'll get a lot of abuse on the way, but the right thing to do is call for a ceasefire and for peace. So, um, you are right, where the language of peace has gone. Just days ago, Ursula von der Leyen said, if I am the president of the next European Commission, I would like a defense commissioner. She added that the Commission will present a strategy proposal for the defense industry within three weeks. So, is it the future of the European Union, militarization instead of demilitarization that we on the left are advocating. So what, what are your thoughts about this um, statement from Ursula von der Leyen? Well, at one level, I'm not very surprised that she's made the statement, but uh, it doesn't mean I agree with it. I don't. What I find so depressing at the present time is that uh, NATO is now requiring all its member states to spend at least 2% of their gross national product on uh, defense. In the case of the UK, it's being raised to 2.5%, and there are demands to now put it up to 3%. Um, including developing new nuclear warheads. I noticed the German government was very pleased with itself a couple of weeks ago opening a new um, arms factory in Germany to um, supply further weaponry. And President Biden uh, bypassed the whole uh, US parliamentary system of the Senate and the House in order to send a hundred million pounds worth of what he called urgent supplies of armaments to Israel at the present time. We seem to be getting ourselves into a scenario that the only security in the world is obtained by the ability to kill people rather than the ability to deal with the social issues, the injustice issues that so many people around the world face. And in the face of this um, pressure, and it is huge pressure from the media, from arms companies and many others, too many on the center ground and even on the left in politics sort of collapse and say, well, okay, that's the only, only show in town, so we'll have to go along with it. Well, where does that lead us to? Think of it another way. Every million dollars spent on developing an, a tank or a new aircraft or something like that or some new form of surveillance systems is a million dollars not spent on health, not spent on education, not spent on housing, not spent on care for those that need it. And so we end up with a situation where we preside over increasing inequality and poverty while we develop more and more arms for more and more wars. Now, I'm not pretending bringing about peace where there are huge problems is easy. Of course it's not easy. 
Everybody knows that. But you have to look at the fundamental causes of war and the outcome. Take um, Iraq, for example, or Afghanistan, for example. Iraq, the West, mainly the US and Britain, but a lot of other countries eventually joined in, went to war in Iraq. The US dropped um, 4,000 tons of bombs on Iraq, which actually is less than Israel has dropped on Gaza over the past three months. Um, tens of thousands of people were killed. And um, did it actually solve anything? In my speech at the huge rally we held in London in 2003, I said I was opposed to the invasion of Iraq because it will create the w refugees of tomorrow, the terrorists of tomorrow, the wars of tomorrow, and it will solve no problem. Sadly, where was I wrong? Where was I wrong? The wars moved on to Syria, to Libya, and to elsewhere. There has to be a coherent agenda for peace. And that doesn't involve arming yourself to destroy the planet. It involves dealing with the issues of sustainability and of the greed of so many countries to gain the, the um, natural mineral resources of other people around the world. And the last thing I'll say on this is, the nuclear weapons issue is something that has dominated me all, all of my life. If you think about it, it's completely irrational to even think about using a nuclear weapon. If India used a nuclear weapon to bomb the Pakistan city of Lahore, and if Pakistan used a nuclear weapon to bomb the Indian city of New Delhi, millions would die. Not one of them would know which bomb had killed them because it would kill everybody. If somebody was mad enough to say you can solve the problem of Palestine by uh, using nuclear weapons in Gaza, you'd wipe out Israel, you'd wipe out Gaza, you'd wipe out the West Bank, Lebanon, Jordan, and everything else all at the same time. There is no concept anywhere you can use a nuclear weapon that would actually solve whatever you believe the problem to be other than the massive loss of life and a nuclear winter which would affect the climate all over the planet and lead to crop failures, famine all over the planet. They're totally unsustainable in any way. We need to recapture our mojo in opposing the nuclearization of warfare uh, and the military because at the end of the day, we're all at risk because of it. And so I think we just need to be prepared to recapture that message of peace. And uh, do you know what? There's an awful lot of people are prepared to listen to it, provided you offer a rational argument. You cannot go to a, a town that makes military aircraft or makes tanks or makes ships for the Navy and say, we, we're good socialists, we're the left, we don't want anything to do with any of that, we're going to close it all down. You can't close down people's livelihoods. You have to invest in those places to convert them into making other things, to convert them into peaceful products. But you do not want to make enemies of all those that work in there any more than you want to make enemies that everybody happens to be in the armed services. It is about a rational approach in which you take people and communities with you on this. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so allow me to conclude uh, our first set of questions with your peace and justice project you have already mentioned um, uh, briefly, <coughs> but what are your current actions and future plans in this movement and mm. perhaps new political engagement? Well, thanks very much. We were very pleased to set up the Peace and Justice Project. We um, exist um, in London, and but we have uh, about... 60,000 people on our um, supporters list from all over the country and we're doing a number of activities partly working with trade unions on um, developing trade union membership uh, in the baking industry in Britain but also supporting the industrial actions that have taken place 
working internationally, and my partner, Lara Alvarez, who's here, is the international secretary of the PJP, and she's been working with the trade unions through the International Transport Workers Federation and in Mexico on developing uh, agreements there to increase union membership, um, in not just in Mexico, but across Latin America. We're also working on um, several other initiatives. One is the five points, which five demands that I put out, that I read out to you earlier. And those five demands are a way of uniting the left in Britain, uh, whether they're in any particular party or none. And indeed, we're holding a conference in April to promote the five points. And I hope that will bring a lot of people together and put pressure on in the unions and elsewhere and be a sort of point that the left can come together on. Um, they're deliberately framed in that general way, which I think would be acceptable. Um, to most people. We're also involved in um, cultural activities. Uh, we've been defending um, music industry and live music and turning that into political as well. And so we managed to get 1,000, yeah, 1,000 music bands around the country signed up to Musicians for a Ceasefire in Gaza. And they've been doing concerts to raise money for medical aid for Gaza. And we've also produced a book of poetry jointly by Len McCluskey, the former leader of Unite the Union and myself, which is called Poetry for the Many, in which we've each chosen 20 poems. Then other people, such as a very famous British poet called Michael Rosen and others have chosen poetry. And we've done um, events where we we describe why we like particular poems and how we feel empowered by them. And we've been doing events all over the country and we're getting huge attendances at them which want to discuss the liberation of ideas and artistic endeavor and achievement. And the first print of the book sold out in six weeks. So we're doing a reprint of that book and we're very proud of that book. And the next book we're producing is going to be, a, um, it's been going to print v in the very near future. Um, you'll finish the manuscript in the very near future, on the arms trade, which is being coordinated by Laura, and there are many people writing for it, including um, Andrew Feinstein, who is a former South African MP who, do, who exposed the corruption of the arms industry um, in South Africa and in other places. So we're partly a um, way to develop ideas, a space for people to unite and come together around those ideas. We're also very strongly a campaigning force, but above all, we see ourselves as a place for unity. And um, the last thing is, in some ways, the most important, how the left deals with the media. The media, essentially, generally quite conservative, quite right-wing, generally owned by very rich people that want to tell us how to think and how to act, and generally want to destroy the character and denigrate any individual that pops their head up and speaks out for social justice. I should know. I've been uh, the subject of attacks from the media for all of my life. It doesn't actually bother me, but it bothers them. Um, and so it is important that we, the left, not just challenge that media agenda and support brave journalists like Julian Assange, who's um, on trial at the, well, he's not on trial, he's subject to an appeal at the moment, and we are very much part of the uh, Assange campaign, but also develop our own effective social media. Because if we rely on a small number of American-owned companies for our ability to communicate with each other, they can cut that off at any time. Look what they did to the Indian farmers at the height of the protest in Delhi, they suddenly lost all access to mobile phones, to social media, to internet, and everything else. Why? Because the Indian government put pressure on the US companies to cut it off. And it can be done anywhere, at any time. And we need our own system of communication. And so, we've got the skills, we've got the ingenuity, we've got the ideas, but we have to, as you're quite rightly said, be more united and come together to achieve those things. We haven't got the luxury of division. We haven't got the luxury of going off on our own. We've only got the necessity of coming together to challenge this. Otherwise, the far right are waiting there in the wings. Yeah. They're waiting there. The AFD and other right-wing parties are waiting there to try and take over. It's up to us to unite to oppose them. Yes, it is. <laughs>
So, um, very impressive and important um, project. I wish you all the best uh, with this. Uh, you already mentioned uh, Julian Assange. Uh, mm. On Wednesday, the British High Court concluded two days of arguments on whether to grant WikiLeaks uh, founder Julian Assange a new appeal against his uh, extradition to the United States on espionage charges. So tell us more about this. You are very involved into this um, activities uh, and uh, struggle for his um, freedom. It's been my pleasure and my honor to work with and support uh, Julian Assange. And um, to me, he's a very brave, very creative journalist who managed to discover an awful lot of uh, very uncomfortable truths about um, not just American activity in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also some big corporations, what they were doing in Africa and what other governments are doing. And we had an exhibition um, of artwork in support of Julian Assange. And in order to emphasize the point, we put a long bookshelf along one side of the room. It would have been from here to that wall there, the whole of this length here. And a shelf was, a shelf was put for the whole length. And um, the organizer of the Assange campaign reprinted every single one of the WikiLeaks cables and information they'd produced and put them e into bound books, with very small print. And the books, as I say, extended from one side of the room to the other. And if any one of us here, however brilliant we are at reading very fast, decided to read them, it would take us 120 years. So if you and I shared it between us, it'd be 60 years each of reading just to get to the end of his books. That's the volume of information that he's revealed. He was then charged under the US Espionage Act. The Espionage Act was brought in by Nixon, um, a Nixon administration. It's the one that put Daniel Ellsberg in prison. Sadly, Daniel has now died. And um, they sought to extradite Julian. He w then hid in the Ecuadorian embassy in London and sought asylum there with the support of President Correa to his eternal credit. And then when the government changed in Ecuador, um, Julian was then arrested um, and uh, has now been in HMP, Her Majesty's Prison, Belmarsh, since uh, for nearly five years now. Uh, Belmarsh is a maximum security prison. It's a horrible place. I've been to visit people in there several times, and I went to visit Julian there um, very recently, and I spent an hour and a half with him talking about his case. The position is that the US applied for extradition in the British courts. They lost the initial case on the, only on the argument that um, Julian's mental health was so precarious that he could commit suicide on returning to, on being sent to the USA. Um, and uh, the US government then appealed on that and won it on the basis that they would treat him properly and he wouldn't be faced with that danger. Um, we obviously contested this very heavily and a very long case was presented. In making the judgment, the judge didn't properly answer all the questions. So a new application was put in by Julian uh, to the courts this week for a two-day hearing, which was heard this week, and that will decide whether or not Julian could be um, extradited to the US. But the decision would have to be made by the Home Secretary, Minister of the Interior, to decide whether he, he could go or not. But if the court decides, and it will be announced on March the 15th, that Julian um, has lost that case and therefore is due for extradition, we are then prepared to mount an immediate appeal to the European Court of Human Rights 
in Strasbourg, which is part of the British judicial system in the same way as part of the uh, Slovenian judicial system and indeed every other signatory nation, and the case would be heard there. So the important thing is to stay strong and stay supportive of Julian. If Julian goes to the USA, he'll be put on trial yet again. His health will obviously suffer grievously. I mean, anyone that's been five years in that prison suffers grievously. And it'll have another effect. Every single real journalist around the world that's faced with the possibility of finding a story out that's embarrassing to somebody that's very powerful, or a company, or a military establishment, or something, anywhere in the world that's very powerful will think, no, I won't pursue that, I won't, I won't write anything, I won't print anything. It'll be a massive form of censorship on real journalism all around the world. And so it is, I believe, very important for our right to know and free speech in general. And indeed, for all of our conventions that we support Julian Assange, and it, it's um, been a very important focus of our activity. And I was there at, outside the court this week, and obviously I'll be there again on the 15th, and we're mounting as many demonstrations as we can in his support. So anything you do, please do. Uh, I, ha I have raised it along with um, Andrej Heiko and others, and Paul Gavin in the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, which we're members of, and we managed to get their support for it, as indeed eventually the European Parliament gave support for him. So there is growing support for Julian, but it needs to grow a lot further and a lot faster. Please join in the campaign for Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. So, um Jeremy, after this first uh, set of questions, uh, before we move on, mm -hmm. I will open the floor maybe for sure. uh, two questions sure. uh, from, the, from the audience, uh, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, torej, odpiram, um, um, priložnost vam dajem za kakšni dve vprašanji. Uh, mislim, da boš pomagala Valentina z mikrofonom. Tukaj je že prvo. Um, Izvolite. Yeah, in uh, tam drugo, yes. ne? Čez Thank you very much vidla. for sharing everything. My name is Kristina, I work as a journalist. Um, you have mentioned that you've been to Palestine and every time you are more depressed. And um, it's been said that Israeli officials say that one of the things that uh, European politicians can do for, that will help them is to keep the idea of two states alive. And I'm wondering whether you see that still as a progressive somehow politics, um, and what would be a progressive um, idea when it comes to uh, the question of Palestine? This is first. Uh, would you Check like to answer questions? immediately two questions? Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, the Should second okay. one. Uh, hello, Mr. Korbun. Uh, my name is uh, Sarjan, and um, my question is related to your introductory remark about uh, neoliberalism and uh, the degradation of uh, uh, the welfare state. Um, I feel like the set decline of uh, left-wing parties that we are currently seeing all across Europe is sort of inextricably linked to the continued decline of membership and militant, uh, militancy of trade unions that we have here in Europe. And uh, seeing as the Labour Party, which you used to lead, was uh, very closely linked to the British Trade Union Confederation. I was wondering if you had any ideas on, or suggestions on how we can uh, reverse this trend and uh, sort of uh, reinvigorate the left wing by uh, bringing life back to the trade union movement. Thank you very much, so Jeremy. Well, thank you for both questions. Uh, first of all, Christina, thank you very much for your question. Um, I think it's... Um, not a good idea to tell people under occupation how they should live their lives and what their own future should be. And uh, the Palestinian people are under occupation and the Western strategy, or particularly the Israeli strategy, has been to divide Gaza from the West Bank, prevent travel between Gaza and the West Bank, um, and uh, obviously the consequences of that are that you have 
people that ought to be able to work together can't even see each other. Um, on the basis of an Israeli withdrawal, first of all from Gaza, but also I think this has to lead to them withdrawal of Israeli troops from the West Bank, which has been under military occupation now for many decades, and uh, dealing with the issue of the rights of Palestinian refugees. You then have to have, a, there has to be a discussion then about what's the future political arrangements within the whole of the Middle East. And that is where there has to be a decision made by Palestinian people and indeed by Israeli citizens about the, the sort of future they want. Do they want to be in a permanent state of war or is it possible that people can actually uh, end up living together in some form? I think the idea that the West should impose, um, a s uh, impose a settlement on a Palestinian people is a kind of almost colonial mentality that goes, goes behind that. And I remember there were some conservative MPs in Britain who got up in Parliament and said um, it was time for us to take over in Gaza and appoint, uh, I mean some British Im imperialists and colonialists never take a holiday, um, that they should uh, appoint a British governor to go into Gaza and run Gaza because nobody there was capable of running Gaza. Uh, I mean, it, it's kind of weird when Britain had the mandate from 1919 until 1948 and uh, had a responsibility to protect the needs of all people within, within the area. So my view is our demands should be the ceasefire now, our demands should be an end to the occupation, and our ma demands should be in solidarity and listen to and work with those working for peace in Israel as well, but not to impose a, an outside settlement on, on the place. That strikes me as the sort of almost Versailles mentality when uh, lines were drawn on the map which creates all the current borders all over the Middle East. Um, on the second question, uh, Sergeant, I think it was, on neoliberalism and trade union membership. Thanks. You're, you're right to a point. Um, trade union membership, in the case of my country, was highest point was uh, 1979 or 80, I think it was. There were 12 million uh, people in trade unions affiliated to the Trade Union Congress. There were other unions as well not affiliated to the Congress, but not very many. And um, it fell very rapidly when um, the Thatcher government closed down almost the entirety of the steel industry and a number of other industries, the coal industry completely gone, and um, that resulted in a loss of union membership. And also um, the membership of unions then stabilized. Um, it's strongest in the public sector, and like in this country and others, the pattern of union membership tends to be older members. But what has happened in the past five years and more rapidly in the past year is union membership has started to go up a bit in certain sectors in Britain. Um, but it needs to go up a lot more, not just amongst those that work in public services, and uh, credit to the teachers union in a period of only three or four months, they recruited 60,000 more members because they were taking action. But it's also looking at the most vulnerable workers, the gig economy, those that are working on zero hours contracts, those that are working as taxi drivers, as food delivery drivers, for Deliveroo, for Uber Eats, and all the other companies which you see in every, every country around the world. They are the ones that desperately need unions in exactly the same way that building workers and dockers in the early part of the 20th century were working on casual labor and desperately needed unions. And so it is up to us to be a bit more imaginative about recruiting people into unions, but also the concept of union membership. Is it just a place where the person holding the job get security? Or is it the concept of a sort of community union, rather like the Workers' Party in Brazil and the unions in Brazil are very much social entities as well as um, industrial 
entities and so that the union then becomes very much part of the community and in our unions unite the union particularly has developed a quite large section called community membership where people who are self-employed working part-time or not in work at all but want to be in support of the unions can join for a very small fee that makes them part of the trade union movement if they move on and get a permanent job then obviously they take their union membership with them and so it is it, it we just need to look a bit more at the structures and the organization um, of the unions and so it, to me it's looking at the areas of vulnerable and vulnerable work particularly in the gig economy that's so important and recruit them into membership and obviously through peace and justice project we're working with the gig economy unions most of whom are not yet affiliated to the TUC, but you know what? They're winning battles, they're getting private contractors removed from hospitals and universities and recruiting very large numbers of people into union membership as a result. And so it is hard work, never easy, because no employer ever wants a union, but you have to then fight also for the legal right to join a union and the legislation that goes alongside it. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I have uh, some more questions for you, and then I will uh, again open the floor uh, to the audience. I would like to see a world in which all military uh, alliances are abolished forever. You told Times Radio two years ago. You have called on Western countries to stop arming, arming Ukraine. Tensions are rising all around the world, in addition to Ukraine, there are the crises in the Middle East, tensions over Taiwan, and many other flashpoints. So, where do you see solutions, if you see <laughs> them, to the increasingly tense situation in the world today? Where, if? Well, let, let's go back a stage. Think um, 1990. Um, end of the Cold War, think of the end of the Warsaw Pact a short time afterwards, and think of that period when in Europe the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe should have become centre stage as a means of um, promoting uh, detente, peace and disarmament. We had the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty already in operation, we had the ABM Treaty, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. We had START II talks. We had a whole process of um, reducing the number of nuclear warheads. And in some cases, countries, because of the um, effect of the non-proliferation, really given up nuclear weapons altogether, South Africa and Argentina particularly, um, and the, both South America, Africa, and quite a lot of Central Asia are nuclear weapons-free zones. So it's not as if that whole disarmament and peace process didn't have an effect. What I noticed was, uh, during the 90s, whilst many of us in the peace movement were campaigning for arms conversion and uh, production of peaceful products and so on, I, I just remember a conversation I was having with... Um, some uh, senior managers and directors from British Aerospace, main arms manufacturer in Britain, produced a lot of planes, ships, and so on. And I said, look, um, if we wanted you to make um, ships for peaceful purposes, ferries, passenger vessels, freight containers, all kinds of things, and if we wanted you to develop um, more sustainable aircraft rather than military aircraft, he said, look, you tell us what you want, we can make it. We have the skills to do it. We don't make weapons because we want to make weapons. We make weapons because that's the only thing that anyone will buy from us when the government wants to buy them from us. So it is a question of uh, looking at the possibility of that. But what was also going on at the same time was various um, think tanks in the USA were developing um, different ideas. We had um, the project for New American Century being hatched and developed by the right in the USA. 
we had those predicting future wars and so on. I remember being invited to no end of seminars at the Royal United Services Institute in London and other places, and they'd talk endlessly about how we could end up in a war with China, we could end up with a war with India, and so on. All, way, and all of it was sponsored by arms manufacturers, and all of it was about developing conflicts for the future. And then we moved into... Um, the uh, Afghan war in uh, 2001 and then the Iraq war in 2003 and all the other wars that have come since then. And so my concern is, are military alliances a protection or are they actually something that increases the problems and the dangers? Look at the way NATO, at uh, the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, um, then made its internal decisions that actually it was going to expand and um, at the um, Lisbon summit took upon itself a um, global role, continues to take that global role and has been expanding. Um, surely to goodness we can, instead of expanding and starting the danger of more wars, look for a process of peace and, um, and a detente that goes with it. That means, yes, ceasefires. Yes, it means very difficult conversations and talks with people. But at the end of the day, the prize is we spend less of our resources on weapons and more of our resources on the social needs of people. And we don't allow thousands and thousands of soldiers to be killed, either in the Iraq war or in the case of Gaza, tens of thousands of civilians to be killed by very high, uh, high caliber sophisticated weapons. At the moment, we are in now in danger of developing a Cold War, well, it's already developed, I suppose, a worse Cold War with China, which can make things work. The AUKUS Pact, that is the Australia-UK-US Pact, is designed to put nuclear weapons and nuclear warheads into the... Um, uh, South, South China Sea and into the um, um, Western Pacific area and enhance military bases for the US in Australia. Um, that in turn increases Chinese military activity and Chinese expenditure. So you just build up to a conflict that um, uh, you wonder what this conflict is actually for. Uh, China is clearly a huge industrial and commercial power. I suspect there are many in the US and probably in Europe as well that rather resent that. Take it over the broad sweep of history. China was a huge figure on the world stage until the growth of the European industrial revolutions of the 18th and 19th century. I remember a very long conversation I had with President Xi some years ago, and he, he said, Jeremy, please understand that the Chinese think in hundreds of years, not decades. The Americans think in, Americans think in, think, think in months, we think in centuries. Um, and uh, they have this view that China is not attempting to run the world, but is attempting to be respected in the world as a major force in the world, and it obviously is. Now, I don't agree with an awful lot of things that happen in China. I don't agree with the way the um, people are treated in Western Xinjiang province, and a whole lot of things I don't agree with them. Does that mean a lack of engagement with China, or does it mean the opposite? I think there has to be that sense of engagement. Are we going to allow the world to descend into yet another series of wars and global conflicts? Are we going to actually be uh, a voice for peace? And so we have to have that voice for peace, and that's what we're about. And that's why I questioned the whole issue of um, the expansion of, of NATO at that time and I hope that um, we can develop a renewed thinking on the left and uh, I've, I'm in the midst of, well I've almost finished it, writing a book about my experiences um, in my political life as well as the period of leadership of the party and it's set me thinking a great deal about how you manage to mobilize the peace movement beyond the peace movement because we're all in political parties, otherwise we wouldn't be here. We're all in movements, otherwise we wouldn't be here. There comes a kind of comfort zone of being with your, your own organization and your own friends, which is great, but it doesn't necessarily influence anybody else. You've got to go out there and take that message out there. 
and that, that's the that's the challenge before us. Elections are an important part of that challenge, but they're not the only part of that challenge. There's lots of other ways of reaching out to people. So thank you, Jeremy. I have uh, many other questions, but I will stop because You're get told off for going on too no, no, long as well. Valentina is informing me that in the audience we have some more questions, and yeah, maybe it's better to open the floor because uh, we could talk uh, the whole night and uh, it's not going to be uh, end. So please, sprašujem uh, torej uh, naj za nove prijave, ker je kar nekaj zanimanja, pa bo Valentina dala. So, uh, maybe two questions two and questions then you will... Uh, okay, two questions. Uh, hi, I'm Nates. Um, you talked about in the opening remark a lot this about... Is it, sorry. Yeah, yeah. you talk a lot about... Um, Nates empty stomachs, etc., and about being green and moving towards like less industrial complexes, right? So between, before your reign as president of the Labour Party, the Labour Party talks specifically about funding small farmers, etc., right? Which, Ror, uh, which Rory Stewart and the Tories took over from you because you were incapable of actually financing and going through those policies, right? I'm sorry for being so mean <laughs> in this one, but uh, why does it continuously happen that left-leaning parties, even all over Europe, move away from self-sustaining availability, such as small farmers, and move on back to big agricultural farms? Why does this constantly happen, and why don't we see an upward trend to funding small farmers and left-leaning ideology? Thank you. Uh, Še? Is there another question? Je še to za kako vprašanje, če ne bomo dali priložnost, da odgovori? Tukaj... Hi, Jeremy. I'm Grega from Levica Party. Uh, you are not uh, being admired by socialists uh, only because you try to move Labour Party on socialist track during your leadership, uh, but also uh, because you stood up to really disgusting smears and accusations of anti-Semitism uh, by new uh, labor leadership. Um, but, I mean, sadly, uh, this is not that uncommon practice also among other parties of uh, European left that should be presumably socialist. Um, so, I mean, uh, we can also see this uh, practice in, sadly, in our own party when left-wing left uh, members are being purged. Uh, so, what would be your advice to uh, members of supposedly left-wing parties that want to secure their party's uh, socialist track? So, what uh, would be your um, advice for this? Thanks. Um, first of all, on the question on farming, thanks very much for the for, thanks very much for the question. It's a very very good question and one that I actually am very pleased you've asked. So, thank you. Um, I grew up in a farming community and I come from a countryside background even though I now represent the most urbanized place in the in the country which is kind of weird but there you go um, and I think that small farmers are actually more sustainable than big farmers and are more likely to be um, protective of the biodiversity and natural world that surrounds them which is an essential part of farming and uh, I ad advocate actually publicly owned land being rented out to farmers because at the moment to get into farming certainly in Britain or, or anywhere else it is you need so much capital you simply can't begin to get anywhere near it whereas you have rented farms it can be decades and decades of a rented farm that means you've actually got uh, a possibility of making a living out of it and the um, sale of uh, so much of the former collective farms of um, Russia, Ukraine, most of Eastern Europe has not resulted in necessarily a diversity of farming. It's actually resulted in basically huge agribusiness on a parallel and often with American or Western European money to take those over. And they are monocultural, monocropping, therefore automatically very damaging to biodiversity because you do need to have a diversity of what you produce as well as the management of the land and the uh, borders around the land to ensure that biodiversity. Now biodiversity is sometimes seen by 
simplistic media as being a kind of uh, or something environmentalist and a luxury they always go on to it. it doesn't it's actually essential to to our lives in um s the south of england there was um a very large privately owned estate um an enormous 30,000 hectares i think it was huge um and it was plowed up during the second world war to produce wheat it was all marginal land. It never actually produced very much wheat. And when the subsidies stopped, the wheat production stopped. So they didn't know what to do with it. And so one of the family sort of took it over and rewilded it. Rewilded it and uh, encouraged um, diversity of animals, birds, insects, different trees, and so on, all, everything, and actually produced some crops and so on from it as well. To begin with, all the neighboring farmers complained and said, what on earth are you doing? You're messing up our f system, you look untidy, your, your fences are not straight, your hedges are not nice, and you're terrible people, why don't you go away? And then after five years, they discovered their productivity of their fruit, their vegetables, and their cereal crops was improving. Why? Because there was more insect life to pollinate the plants. And so the increase in natural sustainability, for want of a, a better word, was actually good for the even traditional farmers who then found they needed to spend less money on herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers because the way the farming was being done. And so I want to see sustainable agriculture. I also want to see um, sustainability of urban agriculture as well, which is, again, a possibility. Because I think we need to grow far more of our crops and carry them uh, less great distances. And so in the case of London, uh, uh, until the 1950s, pretty well all fresh fruit and vegetables came from within 50 miles of London. Now, the vast majority of it comes from Spain, Italy, South Africa, you name it. It, it comes from somewhere else. And so one of my ideas is to... Uh, actually encourage the growth of sustainable small-scale farming. But that means bringing up the next generation that are not divorced from nature. School gardens, school growing projects, school vegetable projects are actually quite important. Every child is not going to end up a farmer. No, they're not. They're going to be engineers, they're going to be all kinds of things. But understanding that we have to live with nature is a basic socialist philosophy. So I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, the works of William Morris, who was um, a socialist writer and thinker in the late 19th and early 20th century. And he was very keen on protecting skills, but also protecting sustainability in the treatment of um, rural life and rural and rural areas and so um, it is a question about sustainability and thank you very much for, for the question I, I'm I'm basically with the farmers and uh, whilst they there are farmers protests at the moment in lots of countries basically they're protesting because they are victims of the supermarket power of supply and the prices they can enforce so all those that campaign to abolish um, state purchasing agencies of agricultural products should think again because taking away the guaranteed price to farmers meant that the farmers then thought they were moving into a free market. No, they weren't. They were moving into a market controlled by a very small number of very big supermarket chains like Walmart stroke Asda, like Carrefour, like Tesco and so on, um, which actually has damaged farming far more than anything else that's been done. And so develop your rural policies and support the farmers, okay? Thank you. Um, the, other, the other question um, on the abuse and um, racist stuff that's been said and done. Uh, thanks for what you said and thank you for the way that you put it. Um, Anti-Semitism is a vile evil in our society. Islamophobia is a vile evil in our society. Anti-black racism is a vile evil within our society. There is no hierarchy of racism. Racism is wrong in any form, any place, any time. 
the history of this continent is one of the abuse of Jewish people going back to the 12th century when Jewish people were expelled from Britain, came back in the 17th century, um, and the expulsion of Jewish people from Russia in the late 19th century, and the systematic and accepted cultural anti-Semitism that was there throughout Europe in all countries, France, Britain, Germany, Italy, throughout. The Nazis exploited it to the uh, great degree and um, managed to blame Jews for all the failings of the Weimar Republic and everything that went with it. And uh, then uh, that ended up with the Holocaust, which also took the lives of the lesbian and gay community, Gypsy, Roman and Traveller community, and every prominent left-wing figure in Germany. The Nazis used anti-Semitism to kill millions of Jewish people. I don't underestimate that. I don't separate that from anything else. That was the unique evil of the 20th century. When I became leader of the party, I discovered that there was no system for dealing with educating our members or challenging them if they made racist remarks or acted in a racist way or a discriminatory way at any time. I said that had to change. There had to be a system of independent examination of each allegation and necessary actions taken at the end of it. All left parties should, I believe, do that. It shouldn't be up to the leader to decide whether somebody they've never met has done something they'd never heard of before. It should be up to an independent process to decide it. Um, I was accused, absolutely wrongly, of covering up anti-Semitism in the party. The very opposite was the case. And um, accusations were made and uh, the uh, you, uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission produced a report on it which said that there had been inter in interference by the leader's office. Yes, there had been in the past. That is exactly what I stopped from happening. And they also accepted, which didn't get much publicity, that I'd made efforts to try and change it through the change in procedure. There were then further investigations and reports. And one was a re document was leaked which showed the behavior of senior right-wing officials in the Labour Party that sought systematically to undermine my leadership and that of the left within the party. Um, and also uh, what's called the Ford Report, which is a report that investigated the um, conduct of um, people within the party and actually exonerated my role in it all, in, in my view, having read all of these documents myself. And so, I stand against racism in absolutely any form. And I will always stand against racism in any form. We should all and must all stand against racism in any form. And um, I'm proud to say that on the last um, very big Gaza demonstration we did in London, there was an enormous block of people marching down the road together. And what was the banner? Jewish block for peace in Palestine, Jewish bloc in support of the Palestinian people led by Jewish Voice for Labour. So the idea that um, by supporting the Palestinian people that makes you anti-Semitic is simply wrong. It's perfectly possible to have a rational discussion about the politics and history of Israel and Palestine and for that matter all the neighboring countries you don't have to descend into any kind of racist tropes, any kind of Islamophobia or anti-Semitism. And it's up to us to be strong enough to do that. And when unfair, wrong allegations are made against an individual, if you believe they're unfair and wrong, say so and defend that person against these foul attacks that have been made against them. I'm just not prepared to walk by on the other side while racists exist within our society. I will always be on the side of the anti-racists in our society. Uh, so, Jeremy, thank you very much. Maybe your last message, some encouragement for the future. Cool.
very short maybe. Very short because we've got no more time. Thank you very much for your tolerance and I'm very sorry that you've had to listen to all of this in English. I do apologize. <laughs> the English education system has badly failed. It hasn't taught people enough languages. <laughs> so, so I'm very sorry and I'm very appreciative of the fact that you've also tolerated what I've had to say in English. Can I say it's been an absolute pleasure being here. What unites us is hope. What unites us is that idea of a world where everybody matters, every child has a decent future, where we don't go to war, we campaign for peace, where we don't destroy the natural world, we sustain the, natural, the, the justice of the world, and above all, that we provide people with decent living and their rights. That comes from activity, comes from education, but it's not all done by meetings, it's not all done by leaflets, it's not all done by books, it's not all done by film, it's not all done by music, it's not all done by art, it's not all done by poetry. It's done by bringing all those things together. And it's as the Americans always said, it's bread and roses too. Thank you. <laughs>